All right, hello again, and welcome back to the closing ceremony. Now, we want to congratulate all of you for making it. Now, over the course of this weekend, Sorry about that, folks, but once again, welcome to closing ceremonies um, of Hack the North. Now, we want to congratulate you again for making it to the end of this hacking weekend. Um, so over the course of this weekend, we've seen some um, cool projects, some pretty frantic troubleshooting, but also some spectacular demos. Uh, so I hope you've all had a chance to attend some cool workshops, uh, get your work, uh, workout in, in the aerobics class, um, or network with hackers and sponsors in the networking sessions. Now, our amazing judges have spent the last few hours listening to your demos and choosing finalists from all the incredible submissions, which is not an easy job. So a huge thank you to Eric Michikovsky, Tiffany Ashley Bell, Kasar Yunus, Jen DeWalt, Ellen Chiza, Patrick Hannigan, Dion Nicholas, Henry Shi, Michael Gibson, Danielle Strachman, Gregory Koberger, Yitong Zhang, Phil Rivard, Jay Cooper, Dananja Jayalith, as well as Chris Best, Chris Bryson, David Greer, Tyler Campaign, Alex McCarr, Luke Eisman, Lyndon Tibbetts, Mohit Chepudira, Hongwei Liu, Stephen McCartney, Evan Stites Clayton, Eric Diep, Nabil Fahel, Andrew Nicholas, Jordan Joke, and also Sunil Sharma, LP Maurice, Yost Auerkirk, Leo Polovitz, and Makosinski. Alexis Smirnov, Darina Kulia, Arjun Buptani, Mar Mayar Ricey, Nicholas Zilwaga, Tanner Philp, Jonathan Norris, Luba Yudasina, as well as Kathleen Liu, Caitlin Young, Jacob Willemsma, Moaz Saidat, Vishal Mathur, Victor Vu, Valentin Satskin, Kevin Lau, Liam Horn, Adam Wuton, Sean Young, Nima Vaziri, for taking the time this Sunday to be at Hack the North. So this year, we chose 24 finalists from our submission pool. So congratulations to the try to breakme team, the GroupShot team, the Git3D team, the Quarantime team, the DeskyBot team, the Karaoke Party team, the Subspace team, the Merge Count Flicks teams, the Copycat team, the Legis team, the Control Air Space team, the Corona Escape team, and also the Help Here team, the Tabular team, the Temporal Vif team, the Cast 3D team, the Jump team, the Quickmark team, the Fit Buddy team, Clinic Connect team, Recipe to Go team, Mail Monitor team, Fridge Space team, and the Mash Me team on their incredible projects. Now, we'll be inviting a few of our finalists onto the stream to demo their project, but please check out the message sent in the announcements channel on Discord to see all the video demos and dev posts of our amazing finalists. So there's an incredibly cool hack, so I'll be definitely checking them out. Now, we'd like to introduce you to our judge panel who will be providing comments on today's finalist projects. Let's please welcome Eric Michikovsky, founder of Pebble and a partner at Y Combinative, uh, Tiffany Ashley Bell, founder and executive director of The Human Utility, and Kasar Yunus, the founder of Talkbin and also a partner at Y Combinator, onto the stream. All right, welcome. Hello, Eric. Hello, Kasar. Hello, Tiffany. It's nice to have you here. Great to be here. Likewise. Amazing. Now, before we get started, can we please have just a quick intro about who you are and a bit about your background? I could uh, go first. My name is Eric. Uh, I'm a Waterloo grad from 2009 uh, and a frequent uh, Hack the North uh, uh, audience member, I think. I was at the first one and at quite a few of them. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing all the uh, pitches today. Yeah, I can, uh, go next. Um, I'm Tiffany Bell. I'm the founder and executive director of an organization called The Human Utility, where we basically use tech and crowdfunding to pay water bills for people. Um, previous life, I was a computer science major at Howard um, and also a YC alum, and I'm excited to be here. I've been um, coming to Hack the North since like 2015, so I'm glad to be participating, at least in this way. And uh, my name is Kasser. Uh, I think this is the YC group. I, I've, I've got, I'm seeing the theme here. Uh, also YC alum, also worked at YC previously where I was a partner in COO. And uh, now I run my own, my third startup, uh, which is called Applied Intuition. And we build uh, 
simulators and uh, related infrastructure for the uh, kind of self-driving industry. And uh, yeah, great to be here. Great, thank you so much. And thank you again for taking the time to come to Hack the North. Now, in no particular order, let's get on with our finalist demos. So for our first finalist, we have Aradia presenting Karaoke Party. Okay. It looks like where uh, Aradia isn't in the stream, so let's move on for now uh, to Timothy presenting Mall Monitor. All right, we're just waiting um, for a few of our finalists to join the stream. In the meantime, um, I think maybe we could talk a little bit about, um, so uh, Eric and Kasari, have you guys judged at previous Hack the Norths? Yes, but in person, which is very different. In yes, I can <laughs> believe that. Yeah, um, it's, a lot, it's a lot different when you're in the same building as, the, mm -hmm. as everyone's been hacking in for the last three days. It has a certain, you know, special a special aura that you don't really get as much over over zoom yeah yeah definitely the energy in the building uh, when i went to hack the north last year was was amazing just seeing all these people together all right yeah. uh looks like we're ready again um for mall monitor presented by timothy hi everyone um yeah thank you for um opportunity and I'm part of Team Mall Monitor. This is our team and uh, the, orig the origin of our uh, project comes from the current pandemic that we're all facing. So one issue that I'm sure many of us have faced are the long lines and um, often incorrect queuing, especially for stores and restaurants that have multiple entrances and exits. It's very difficult to really strictly follow regulations and have a good estimate of the wait time. Uh, and we've developed this project to kind of uh, limit the unnecessary health risks. And um, malls and restaurants are very heavily populated because of um, maybe a lack of tools. And we're hoping that our project uh, will allow store owners to have a dashboard to check in on their situation of their um, store at all times and to detect the number of people ingoing and outgoing from uh, the store at all entrances. Uh, we've utilized a YOLO v3 network trained on the COCO data set. Uh, we also use HTML, CSS, Angular, Azure, and Flask. And I'll show you our web app here. Uh, currently, we just have uh, two YouTube videos that we've processed um, uh, because at the time, limitations of a hackathon, we're not able to uh, complete the pipeline completely. Um, but our web app uh, is functional, and uh, these values are updated using a JSON formatted file. And um, these are uh, entries for stores and uh, future works include adding additional stores and really integrating the, um, the, the different cameras. So this is to simulate a, a restaurant or store with two cameras, uh, but the metrics are calculated from only the right camera. Uh, so for the machine learning based uh, part of the project, uh, we use YOLO v3 for object detection. We detect people as well as accessories. Um, and we highlight the people that are going in uh, with a green box and going leaving with a red box. It's kind of hard to see, but as they cross the red line, we can determine that and also provide a height stamp for a, their approximate height. Um, additionally, uh, we are also able to uh, just calculate um, their accessories and link them to the unique ID. We utilize a ModB uh, Python library to do tracking and give each object or person a unique ID. And this is just um, an example of our output to localhost. Um, we were unable to integrate the system completely, but we, we uh, get this JSON string uh, output to show that we do have the capabilities uh, to integrate the entire system, but due to a lack of 
um, experience uh, in deploying a network and um, a web app with, um, yeah, with, with the network, uh, we were unable to finalize and complete the pipeline. Um, and yeah, that is our presentation. And uh, thank you all for listening. Are there any comments or questions? I think I might have to defer to Kasser on this one. This is definitely in Kasser's wheelhouse. Yeah, it's super interesting. That's uh, that, that that's for sure. Um, I think uh, you know, especially considering how much you uh, you know got done with a very limited amount of time and a limited data set. So I, whatever mm -hmm. anomaly, whatever uh, misdetections or anomalies that you're seeing, all that can be cleaned up very easily. So as a as a, the intention of Hack the North, fantastic. I mean, I mean, really, really. I think hits the nail on the head. Um, I think a big part of, um, uh, and then you know, if you talk about a startup more broadly, let's just kind of adjust that from just, just the initial MVP and what, what this would be with like a, as a company. I think the uh, point here is so much of um, young companies is meeting the market at the right time. So if this was a year before or a year later, it wouldn't be as as kind of uh, you know impactful. And so in that sense, it's, it's, it's also a big, big kind of, um, uh, I think a big, big, uh, you know, accomplishment or very, it's very positive. I think the market received this really well. And and that could be the wedge into building that relationship with the small business owner to ultimately give them a lot more things. This could be an easy loss leader for you where you just give this to them to establish the relationship. And once you have the relationship, you can kind of sell them a lot of other things. I mean, Talkman very much had my, my second startup, uh, which was the uh, mentioned was a YC company, very much had the same kind of uh, go to market uh, ethos. So. I mean, you're setting a high bar for the other, <laughs> for the other contestants or the other other folks we're going to talk to. But it's, it's, I mean, this is this, this is great. Uh, it's so, great. yeah, I have, a, I have a question about like how how do you envision people using this? Like, I see you're collecting the data, and this is like going to be inputted into a system. But like, what what would be the user interface? I guess for a, like a customer at the store eventually. Right. Um, I think we focused mainly on the store owners and how we could get some marketing information and, and stuff like that. But I oh, think I, um, for the for the um, I was thinking more for the COVID use case. Yeah, like, for the COVID for sure. Yeah. Um, we envision like just knowing the peak times of well, how many people there are and maybe which areas of the store are more heavily used and knowing that information maybe you can. Um, you know, use alternative entrances or uh, know the perfect time to go in, uh, stuff like that. Um, I think that data would be beneficial. I've got to say, it's it's the weirdest thing in the world to see a half an hour lineup to get into a Trader Joe's here in the Bay Area. So <laughs> that kind of thing would be super useful. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think also just in terms of because a lot of these doors are, are kind of an open, um, you know, uh, with a with a motion motion sensor, you could probably do it remotely. I, I think probably the the WalMarts and the Trader Joe's because they're more, uh, you know they're they're big corporations and there's maybe more liability. But for small businesses, especially like the corner market, you know, where the, having a person at the front door might be maybe really expensive. Uh, some something like this on a laptop uh, where you, it could be really really fantastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. I would, uh, I mean, if, uh, I don't know if we're supposed to be giving this advice, but I think it's a great business. <laughs> 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 Apply to YC. I think that's the, uh, <laughs> that's the message. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for your feedback. Um, yeah. All right, thank you, Timothy. And next up, do we have Aradia from Karaoke Party? Perfect, let's welcome on Aradia. All right, awesome. Yeah, so I'm just gonna go through a little bit, I guess, about what our app's about. I don't, unfortunately, have any slides, but we are gonna get into a live demo and hopefully that'll be a bit of fun. But anyways, here it goes. So in light of COVID-19, the need for social interaction and emotional support is greater than ever. Hundreds of thousands of people around the world have reported feeling anxious, lonely, and even sad during quarantine. That's why we decided to dedicate our hack towards supporting mental health. I wanna to introduce to you Karaoke Party, a new way to play karaoke online with friends and feel energized once again. A true social relief from our everyday routines that's only one click away. So how does it work? Well, let's get into it. I will just start sharing my screen. Uh, give me a sec here.
Awesome. So here we are in the app. Um, and you see one of my partners, David. Whenever you're whenever you're ready to go, David, let's have let's have some fun. All right, let's do this. Okay. I've been trying to call I've been on my own for long enough Maybe you can show me how to love Maybe I'm going through withdrawals You don't even have to do too much You can turn me on with just a touch Baby I look around and the city's cold and empty No one's around to judge me I can't see clearly when you're gone. Up uh, on. I said, ooh, I'm blinded by the light. No, I can't sleep until I feel your touch. I said, ooh, I'm drowning in the night. Oh, when I'm like this, you're the one I trust. All right, man. That, that was that was interesting. And now you know why I went into software engineering as a career path and, and not singing. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, so you just saw what our app basically is. I'd love to talk a little bit about some of the technical implementation details. So essentially Karaoke Party is built on a unique architecture that gives our users the best karaoke experience possible. Our front end is built with React, which allows us to offer a unique modern UI design combined with the images like you saw at the weekend to stay connected with your favorite singers. The video chat capability of the app is built in something called Agora IO. And when we combine this with WebSockets, it helped us create this engaging real-time experience. But really, the back end is, um, is where a lot of the magic happens. So as fun as karaoke is collaboratively, we thought it's even more fun with a competitive element added. And that's why we developed the functionality to evaluate individual performance of multiple participants like you just saw throughout a single karaoke session and dynamically allocate points to the best singers you would have saw, seen mine and David's points keep going up there. So for every song in our playlist, we've used something called an LRC file to dynamically slice the song into its primary bars that players sing in rotation like you just saw. And Karaoke Party records each bar sung by a participant and sends it to our server where it's converted into a WAV file and compared with the same clip but sung by the song's original singer. So in this case, The Weeknd, we're comparing my singing with The Weeknd's. And you know that's not great, but it is what it is. <laughs> we extract the pitches from the audio files using something called a yin algorithm. And we're mapping pitches at individual frames to actual musical notes. So the similarity of the notes over the duration of the entire clip is what determines the player's score for that particular bar. And once the score is determined, it is sent to all clients through WebSockets to ensure everybody knows who's in the lead at all times. And yeah, like, Essentially, karaoke party, we think, is going to be a fun weekend activity for some. But in this time of need, for many, it's going to become a way to help friends and family feel connected every day. And, and yeah, that's, that's about it. That's amazing. That's, that is, yeah, that's, that's super amazing. impressive. Um, <laughs> At first, I thought it was I thought you were the, just reading um, off the uh, reading off the um, uh, the lyrics, but when you said that they're actually critiquing their singing ability while you're while you're doing it, that's that's pretty cool. Could you? Uh, you're saying you're doing frame by frame. Can you? Can you do? Uh, can you show scores live somehow? Um, and to, to make you know, just to make it more uh, dynamic. Yeah, that's a really good question. We were, you know, we were trying to work on this for a long time. We were we were up till the full 10 a.m. Essentially. The, the, the issue we think with like the real time is there's some latency to the actual processing, right? For, for generating the score. Because essentially what's happening is, so I sing, right? Like two lines. Our front end records what I just said. That gets converted into a WAP file sent to our server. And then we run our comparison algorithm, which takes some computational time, right? And so to get into actual real time, I don't know, maybe we like somehow get the processing onto the client side as well and somehow get sockets in there um, to do that. But, you know, I think it's an iterative process, um, but maybe it is possible, you know? I, yeah, think I, 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 I think you don't have to do it every time tick. You could do it every five seconds, every 10 seconds. And 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 because I think I think the, that competitive nature where you're kind of showing, are you going up or down? 
And, you know, if it's a team activity as well, you know, uh, being able to blame an individual person for a poor performance is <laughs> oh, <laughs> when the stakes are so low. I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty fun. Totally, totally. Have you considered also adding auto tune for those of us who aren't blessed with the ability to sing? Oh, so that we can yeah. actually like, like basically give us some guardrails. Like, you know, when you're bowling and you gotta, you gotta put the, uh, the bumpers in, like, I need a little bit of that. Yeah, honestly, it's so interesting because when we were doing our research and work, we, we, were, we generally like frequency distributions, right? To like compare sort of, you know, my audio with like the weekends and just seeing how different the amplitudes are, like the weekends on, you know, another level and I'm like way below his level. So it would be interesting to see how we can sort of like standardize this. So what, what about this? Like I, I didn't catch, are you both singing into the same computer or are you singing into separate computers as well? Do you mean like me and David? Yeah. Yeah, so this was us on our own computers. We're like in different houses. So right now, uh, we weren't able to deploy on on the cloud yet, but uh, one of our other friends is is hosting, and one of our other partners, he's hosting. And so this is a connection through sockets right now. So I gotta say that like that alone is a pretty important problem that people are trying to solve during quarantine. Um, my my mom's part of a singing group, and unfortunately, you know, they used to get together every week and sing together. But they haven't been able to do that during the entire quarantine. So. I don't know. Maybe I could send this to her, and she and the uh, she and the um, the group could actually sing together. Like that that that's like an unsolved pro problem as of right now. Man, yeah, there's cool. a there's a team member uh, at Applied who's in a like a barber shop quartet. I don't know what they're called uh, exactly, but uh, he says that the issue with singing together is just like you know the latency between uh, different uh, you know different folks and their own setup. So I think. That itself is a problem that I bet you is is a if good you can one. Crack that. Yeah, yeah. And then if you can, if you can, like the the I'm always thinking about the next, you know, the next step. And the next step is like if you can at least because this is pure entertainment, you could make it, uh, you know, have have kind of chat heads uh, around a song, and there's literally you know some graphics live stream to well TikTok. And, yeah, exactly. Oh, and then yeah. you can live stream that to. I mean, you can you can stream it to a Twitch platform or something like that, but or you can create clips. And then, uh, you know, that's that's who you get that kind of uh, viral uh, bump. Uh, uh, it's it's uh, it's fun. It's it's, it's, it's great. So, yeah, which of yeah. you are the of the people that were on the team? Who was the best singer, based on the algorithm? Based on the algorithm, um, it's it, it was kind of fluctuating. I think you know we were we were kind of training. We did a lot of practice. Uh, I, I didn't even catch who won that time, but I, I don't know. I I think I'm. Like I'm not a great singer, but I'm probably better than my teammates. So and there's I'll, I'll also the here. fact that are, are, you have to tune to make sure that your algorithm like actually evaluates the uh, like for someone who's actually a good singer, will they get a high score? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, man, I, I I wish we I wish we had a really good singer to, to try it out with. That's a good idea. We will we will test that out. But well, maybe there's someone on the Discord that can like jump in and, and oh yeah, uh, help yeah. Us. oh yeah, <laughs> exciting stuff. Yeah, I think uh, I think I think this uh, I think the larger point for folks, you know, who are not on your team, uh, I do think this types of like, um, you know, uh, fun activity that you can do remotely. That's more than just watching, you know, one to many rather than it's 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 many to many or or few group to few group, I think is, is, is super interesting. It seems like it's a completely empty space, uh, at least from my perspective. And uh, I mean, even when, you know, uh, at Applied, it's sort of, you know, completely remote. Uh, bringing things, this, these types of team activities together, it's, it's, it would be really great, like a group of five or a group of eight, um, because it's kind of boring just to do the same kind of, uh, you know, lunch meetup or coffee meetup where everyone just kind of, kind of chats. So uh, having the activity and then you start with karaoke and you can have kind of almost like a portfolio of things that you can do as a group together. And it turns into like kind of an arcade, a virtual arcade. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's super interesting. Awesome, yeah, guys. I, I really appreciate the feedback. We're we're excited to keep iterating on it. We think we think it's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, awesome. awesome. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you, Aradia. And next up, we have uh, Muhammad presenting Cast 3D Scanner for Medicinal Casts. How's it going, guys? Hey. All right. So I'm Muhammad, a representative from Cast 3D, and today we have a video prepared to demonstrate our project. So I'll get that up and running.
Wow, you guys built that all in the last two days? That's crazy. I think this would take a like an actual big company like yeah. seven years and 3,000 people. <laughs> <laughs> Phillips is still working on it. <laughs> and you had all of that around in your in your uh, workshop. That's that's pretty cool. So the three D element, like the three D printed elements, we had prepped before the event, and then it was all assembled together during the event. And uh, what light are you guys using? It's uh, the Xbox Connect sensor. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. Super. Yeah. And does that give you a high enough resolution to? Uh, you'll you'll see the scan quality at the end. It'll we have cool. it in the in the video. How how um, does the person have to hold their arm very still? So that was something we uh, needed to uh, fix in future iterations. At the moment, it was just us putting our hand out and it floating. It took a little bit of strain, but it is an improvement that we need to uh, work on later down the line. I feel like for someone who has a broken arm, they're gonna have to hold their, their hand pretty steady. That might be hard. When you were researching this, did you find anyone else who was using 3D scanning to and, and printing to build casts? So several people were using uh, uh, photogrammetry. It's another method of uh, 3D scanning, but it's instead of using LiDAR, it's taking pictures all around an object. And that takes a lot longer time because you have to angle your camera every single, at every yeah. single level, getting a picture of the arm. And that would take a lot longer than a two minute scan using a LiDAR scanner. Now, this is for like in the case of someone who's broken their arm. This is after the doctors reset the bones into the correct position. Is that is that correct? Yes. Wow, that's it. Ah, you yeah. might want to pause the video and let us check that out for a second. Yeah, for sure. So, what um, what material did you use for the? Uh, so this was uh, just generic uh, transparent red filament PLA just plastic, although you could print it out in nylon and or some sort of flexible material such as TPU. There's also other stronger variants of plastic such as PETG. That's also takes just as long to print and would provide a lot more rigidity. But we printed this at low infill to get a print going within yep. the time span that we were given. That's great. So let's see the, uh, let's see the scan. Okay, so you get and and did you have to um, did you have to improve this based on uh, like hand, hand measurements or anything like that or did that print was straight from the, the model? So it was mainly just cleanup. SolidWorks has a built-in plugin called Scan to Three D, and it allows you to clean up the mesh. You could remove any like instances that you see, for example, out at the back of the arm. There, there's yeah. just an extra object that doesn't necessarily need to be there, and they also have a sectioning feature that cuts up any mesh object into uh, several cross sections. And then you could just use a simple loft to perform that and then get your cast made. Uh, Mahmoud, what's the current, uh, what, what, I've never had a broken arm or a broken bone, uh, fortunately. Uh, what's the current <laughs> process? Like uh, your arm is broken, you go to the hospital and how's the cast, uh, how is it molded around your, your arm? So usually this is from what I've experienced, at least I've, had several fractures uh, anywhere from my pinky to my skull. But when I fractured my elbow before, uh, you'd sit there for almost an hour just getting a custom ta like tailored plaster cast. And usually the, the plaster cast stays a little wet for a period of time before it dries, which isn't the most pleasant feeling, especially when you're going to get your cast done. You want it to be as simple of a process as it can be, right? And so would um, you envision this, uh, uh, go ahead, Eric. Go, go ahead, Kesha. Yeah, uh, would you envision this being in the in like a, a hospital or a, or a clinic uh, or or uh, uh, how, would it, how would it be? Uh, I believe like similar to an, an MRI machine, for example, it, it functions very similar to it where it just rotates and scans around. I feel like 
if hospitals were to carry one or two around in their facilities, that would improve a lot of cast productions with frequent visits of those people getting broken arms or in later instances, we could design upon and make it scan any other part of the body, for example, a broken foot or however else. So one yeah, thing, it, um, it, go ahead, Eric. We've seen a lot of companies that are working on uh, kind of like remote radiology where um, people will go, come in, they'll do the x-ray, but then they'll actually send the images off to a radiologist who isn't in the building. Um, I think it would be interesting for you, if you're, if you're thinking about working on this long term, to look at what are the most expensive steps in the process of kind of this entire thing, because it's sometimes like not what you always expect. Like you may think it's the the act of the cast making that, that takes time or takes a lot of money, but there's there's other aspects that you'll want to look at. And so one thing you could do is, I think Cast was kind of getting to this, it's like look at the end to end journey of like the person as they go through the process of coming in, getting the bones set, getting the cast made, et cetera, and see which are the steps that you could shave time off and make the whole process faster. Um, yeah, exactly. I would even, I would even uh, maybe even take it a step uh, beyond that and look at uh, you have this essentially new technology, which is uh, cheap lidar. Light, you know, lidar has existed for a long time, but very cheap and uh, easily accessible lidar. Um, and what does that mean in in medicine? And uh, and I think you 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 could you could find some really really interesting applications. Uh, historically, these these you know these uh, sensors have just been. Uh, prohibitively expensive and especially as they as they as these uh, as they become more accurate um that's you know there's a double whammy it's cheaper and more accurate and and so you could do you do really interesting things i i don't know if there's any value in like a full body scan that's like very very accurate but i feel like some some instinct of like if you had millions of people you could probably see interesting variations that 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 but you know now we're just purely in a <laughs> hypothetical land but it's super interesting great work Thank you. Great, thank you, Mohammed. And then next up we have uh, James presenting Healthier. Okay, uh, hey everyone. Uh, I just wanna say uh, thank you for all the viewers and all the uh, panelists and the judges uh, for seeing our application. So we are a team, of, we are a team called Magic4 and my name is James and I will be presenting our application. Uh, so we are a multi-disciplinary uh, team that spans across three different countries and time zones, uh, Canada, Scotland, and Nigeria. And we made up, we are made up of two backend developers, one full static developer and one UX designer. And right now I will be showing you um, my a quick video of what kind of like what our application is about. We are Team Magic 4 with team members Amin, Tele, Janice, and James. Our project HelpBA is a web-based app that enables neighbors helping neighbors through gamified volunteering. 2020 was challenging for everyone, especially for volunteering. People are feeling more isolated and in need of help, but may not have anyone in their neighborhood to turn to. Our goal was to encourage a new social norm of volunteering in people's daily routines in their local neighborhood. Research identified that while over 90% of us want to volunteer, only a fourth of us actually do. With HelpBA, instead of volunteering for organizations, people can sign up to volunteer to help people in their local neighborhood with flexible time commitments. We also gamified volunteering and built our own digital currency, which incentivizes volunteering among social circles. In order to have our, in order to have our own digital currency, we use Microsoft Azure's blockchain service. The smart contract was built using an ERC20 token using Solidity and deployed using Remix. Building our token using the ERC20 standard offers us the opportunity to deploy it in the future on, on the Ethereum network and have it publicly traded. We use Web3 JavaScript, which enabled us to build our own JavaScript RESTful API with Express to create wallets and assign them to users. We also have a separate backend component built in Python, and it uses Flask to offer a RESTful API to our front end. The back end manages a database built with Cockroach DB and is in charge of communicating with the blockchain app. Our front end was used was built using React and React Hooks, and the web app was designed on Figma. Oh yeah, uh, so that's basically uh, an, an, uh, kind of like what our application is about. And now I'll be showing you a live demo of what um, our application is. So, so like first name, we so saw this is a registration page, and I'll going I'll be going over the registration. So let's say our uh, first name is John, last name is uh, Go, username is John Go to com and password. And if you sign up, you'll be going through a, a streamlined onboarding process, which is just uh, basically what uh, thank you for volunteering. And you can earn rewards by helping. So this is kind of like our main application. 
Um, as you can see in the top navigator, you can see we have three different views of volunteer request and profile. And in the bottom, we are using Mapbox to uh, see different um, tasks that's available within our area. So I created one task beforehand, and if you click on the task, you can see uh, the task that is um, uh, the, the information about the task. And we also have a list view for a uh, different user experience. So uh, users can kind of see more uh, faster. So you can click on any of these um, tasks and you can volunteer for one of these tasks. And it would uh, create, it would in the back end, it would kind of like create a, a crypto uh, currency. It would uh, send the user the data. And you once that's complete, it would um, help, it would get all the information about the task and who and the creator of the task and the description and kind of the location of where the task is at. Um, so on our next view, we have a request of volunteer where users can uh, request their, uh, put their task in this, uh, our map. So you could have a, you could select a task type, a time needed, which is, which is we made it into minutes, um, urgency, how fast, uh, urgent business and a random description. So if you press submit, you get routed into this. Uh, our request has been submitted and it uh, successfully. And next view, we will uh, navigate to the profile, which we could kind of see data about more about what my inform what my information is. And um, yeah, so as you can see in the beginning, I. I named myself John Doe, and it, we have all the information. We also implemented a leaderboard, uh, which will add the competitiveness to uh, within different users of how many more volunteers they did. Um, you can see the requests that I posted, and also the uh, people that I helped. And within within these points, um, so the main reason why we uh, we added a currency uh, in order to help our digital currency, we use a Microsoft Azure blockchain service. The smart uh, contract was built as an ERC twenty token to solidify and develop using Remix. Uh, building our token uh, using the ERC twenty stand offers uh, us to opportunity to deploy in the future on the Ethereum main network and uh, have it publicly traded. So as of right now, we just created like kind of like a redeem a uh, token where you can uh, select your gift card. So once you have uh, like 30 points, um, you can select different gift cards of um, different um, companies that would be sponsoring this application. Let's say we want us, uh, we want to buy a, a Starbucks gift card. And once we redeem, we will be uh, navigated to a thank you uh, task. And yeah, that is basically uh, what me and my team built uh, over the hackathon. This is amazing that you all built this just that fast. Um, yep. I, I really think there's a lot of use for this. Um, do you have a sense of like which which target audience you're going to go for with this? Because I think you should actually develop this further. Yeah, so we were actually discussing a lot. So first we were like, we were trying to think more in terms of like the uh, elderly, for example, helping um, a, a, like older people um, like in their 80s or 70s to like, I don't know, maybe they need help like um, carrying their groceries or um, other stuff like that. But we thought that maybe like people in their 80s might not have experience in um, phones or um, technology in general. So we kind of made it more towards like just a um, volunteering task within uh, companies to uh, sponsor us. So like you could uh, help within a, a different animal shelter or Salvation Army to uh, gain like these uh, more volunteering and we could help other people. And it would be interesting to see other people like volunteering and see how, how many other uh, users are uh, volunteering with our application. No, that's amazing. Because I think the other thing as far as like getting people, because you, of course, you have the whole like marketplace problem where you have like two sides that you need to meet each other. Yeah. It would be interesting, like if you tied this to like next door or something, so people would have a sense that would be helpful as far as like the local angle of it. This yeah. is amazing. Yeah, thank you. James, is there any reason you need to uh, like uh, inject blockchain into this? And uh, doesn't isn't it just more simplified if this is just like literally just a a database I, points in it yeah no like so first i mean technically you could just have a a counter or like i don't know just like a counter every time like a user um um a user um uh, like do their volunteering but it was just for like the it was number one it was just for the sake of a uh, learning uh experience and also we were thinking of maybe within this blockchain you could uh like actually maybe like um buy or sell uh 
uh, like maybe like other um, cryptocurrency or maybe pull out money. And it would be more fun to see like um, other uh, sponsors to like help us out. And it was, yeah. Because one other thing, you could also have that crypto be donated back to the organization that people are uh, helping. Yeah, yeah that would be pretty cool. <laughs> Thank you, James, for that demo. Next up, we will have Richard presenting MashMe. Can you hear me? All right, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm just going to get right into it. I'll share my screen real quick. All right. So today I'll be presenting to you, oops, that is the wrong button. Uh, today I'll be presenting to you MashMe. So what is MashMe? MashMe is a site for you to create your mashups. This was, uh, I created this with my team. Shout out to uh, Mohammed, Cliff, and Bill for working with me together this weekend on this project. Uh, we had this idea a while back when we were jamming together and then we found two songs and then it seemed to work well together. And so we tried mashing it at first manually and then it seemed to work out. And then we wanted an easier interface for people to create mashups. Uh, so here is a quick demo of how the program works. So first, the user can specify which songs they want to mash up. So in this case, we're going to be mashing up Hey Soul Sister and your And it will have a mismatch key. It will not sound that great. Um, let's see. OK, so first I'll talk about why, uh, why we created this. What can it help people do? So as we all know, with the pandemic, we have more people working from home, and we have longer working hours. And there are scientific studies showing that music have been proven to improve mental health and productivity of people. Uh, we found that with scientific studies that the BPM of the music can greatly affect uh, the mood and performance. Um, so our app lets you also control the BPM of the songs to mix and match them in a good fashion. So yes, to answer your earlier question, here's a bit of the technology stack we're using. So we have a Flask Python for our backend. Our front end was built using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Everything is hosted on Google Cloud Platform. And uh, we use Splitter to split the uh, main the song into its separate stems. Uh, and then we also use PyDub and uh, Rubber Band to stretch the BPM and uh, the key as well. We took Spotify API to get the BPM and uh, key metadata. And lastly, we used MySQL to store all our uh, files as well as metadata. So in the creation of this app, we experienced several challenges. Uh, the audio processing and the audio splitting, these are very computationally expensive uh, operations. And because of this, there was a long processing time. So the user would enter their two songs and press, uh, they'll ask for the mashup to be created, but they'll have to wait for a few minutes. Uh, so in order to make the UI responsive, we fixed this by caching the more popular mashups. Uh, that way it is available instantly by just accessing the cache. Another issue we hit was that the audio synchronization, the default audio player that HTML provides. It was not built for synchronizing several tracks at the same time, which uh, we're doing here with eight different tracks. So we had to use a, a library that uh, we weren't familiar with, but we were able to get working in order to get the audio synchronization. Now, of course, we have some uh, great features planned to make our app better. Um, so one of the key functionality that we wanted to do, but we didn't get the time for this weekend was uh, mix and match with song sections. So for example, we can pair up the chorus, the verse, or the bridge of songs together. And that way we'll have a more uh, a smoother mashup. Uh, another one was to choose a mood for the mashup. So for example, if you pick like a chill mood, it might be slower. Or if you 
feeling energetic it might be faster uh, we also wanted to have like a list of most popular mashups so that people can browse them and then uh, take some examples that uh, other people have mashed up before and lastly uh, we want horizontal scaling so we can increase the performance of our web servers since uh, with the current performance issues it might be problematic if uh, too many people access at the same time so I just want to end off with some um, mashups that we found really that worked really well and uh, over here is the uh, link for you guys to try it out. We did disable the custom, uh, the ability for you to add your custom songs as uh, it will probably overload the server. But yeah, that's the general gist of MashMe. Thank you for listening. It's an impressive amount of engineering that went into uh, went into that. It, it looks very simple. Like you, you created a really super simple interface that like even I can use, and I'm not much of a music music maker, but I can definitely see how much effort you had to put in on the back end, all those different components to uh, to get that. So it is a very uh, very slick demo. Is it live online? Can we can we go to it? Yeah, so you can go to uh, mashme.tech right now, and then uh, the for example the uh, good mashups that we found. If you do those, those are cached, so those will be available instantly, and you don't have to wait. Richard, do you think that uh, did you guys does the team think about any other um, application other than two people mashing up uh, music together for entertainment? Uh, no, for our case, uh, it was since we all we all like to jam together, we like to play music, and then it was just this was just to like satisfy that curiosity that uh, we had these songs they work together similarly. Uh, we did have some ideas of maybe thinking of, for example, may music plagiarism. Like if two songs fit together a bit too well, something might be suspicious and uh, that might be able to be used. But then uh, we didn't really go further into that. All right. Well, thank you, Richard, for that demo. Uh, next up, we have Arod presenting FitBuddy. Hey guys, can you hear me? Perfect, so I'll just share my screen real quick. Um, all right, there we go. So what I made over the past 36 hours is a thing called FitBuddy. So before we talk about what FitBuddy actually is, let's talk about the problem that it solves. Exercise is crucial to well-being. It's a simple fact that none of us can deny. But the COVID-19 pandemic has led to an average 50% decrease in daily physical activity. And the real issue here is that there's no more there's no more atmosphere or motivation for physical activity nothing is driving us to exercise anymore i'm sure you've all seen in your own lives before the pandemic you'd be motivated to go outside go for walks stuff like that but now with, with everything being from home even work from home there's no more motivation there's no more atmosphere for us to go out and exercise but something i've noticed over the past few years is that when humans are put in competitive environments or friendly competitions such as video games math contests or even hackathons they naturally tend to get motivated. They want to do good in these situations. So I decided to take that motivational philosophy and combine it with this problem. And I came up with this solution, FitBuddy. So I'm gonna give a quick live demo now. So FitBuddy is a two-part solution. We have the live stream from my phone that you can see on the screen right now, that's here. So this is the FitBuddy app. And then we have the FitBuddy device, which is strapped onto my wrist, as you can see here. So how it works is basically through this FitBuddy app, I can challenge my friends to different calisthenic exercises, such as push-ups, squats, sit-ups, all those kind of exercises. And basically, that's when this FitBuddy act, um, activates. So basically, me and my friend both start doing the exercise. And this FitBuddy um, has a bunch of sensors inside it that basically monitor our form, and it counts our reps. And the goal is obviously to get more reps than your friend. Now, obviously, there's a bunch more stuff than that in the app. So we'll quickly take a look at that right now. So to start off, um, for obviously for first time users, you have to connect the phone to the FitBuddy device. So I tried to make that as simple as possible because it really annoys me when like some of those devices, you have to connect to their internet connection, all that kind of stuff. It's extremely simple. You literally take the phone, you tap it on the device and that's it, you're connected. It's extremely simple, okay? So um, before we take a look at the rest of the app, let's go over the um, new workout option. So you can see here, I can tap at the top to select any one of my friends from this list here. So let's just choose the first one, for example, and let's do push-ups, because why not? I'm pretty tired, but whatever. Um, so I'll angle the camera down so you can see me do push-ups. And uh, um, I'll press start. It'll put me in the same room as my opponent, and I will do two or three push-ups. And it'll, you'll see it'll monitor my form, and it will track my movement. So I do, a, I do one, and it counts it right there. Two. I'll do one more. Three. 
All right. And I coded it in such a way so that fake movements trying to mimic the push up, they kind of get filtered out. And um, so no cheating is really possible here. So let's just forfeit this match because I'm not going to do that many push ups. But um, obviously it says nice try because I lost three to nine, but that's basically the concept behind this. It's basically bringing competitiveness into, um, uh, into physical activity and trying to bring up motivation. So at the homepage, I'll just show you a couple of other things that I added into this. Over here, you can obviously see the number of reps you've done today for different exercises and the total time you've worked out. Then you, you also have a fit score. So out of 100, it tells you how active you've been today based on the app. And at the bottom here, one of the coolest things, you know, in a lot of video games where you have different ranks that you try to achieve, it's kind of similar to that in that there's five ranks here from bronze to ultimate. And it combines your wins, your losses, your form into one thing, and you get a rank. And your goal is to try to beat your friends and try to get the highest rank possible, which is ultimate. I've got a, I've got a question. So sure. as someone who, who's worked on hardware before, did you did you have to build something that, that this external device or are you using the Apple Watch as the tracker? I had to build this external device. I'll go into it in a second. Um, it's on one of the later slides, but yeah, I had to build it from scratch. So I'll go into that in a second. So I'll just finish up with the app first. So um, obviously here I can see my friends I think we, as well. We just, got, we just got a few more minutes and we wanted to really get into some of these questions. So you might have to. Sure, sure, yeah. So I'll just quickly wrap up. And you can see some of the previous things here. One more little feature I wanted to talk about in the app is the improve feature. So this device actually sends, um, it has a bunch of sensors in it and it sends um, values to my app over here. And that basically, um, it runs it through an algorithm and it tells you how you can actually improve the form of your exercises. So that's one really cool feature that I added in. Um, based on the hardware for the actual device, this is what it looks like inside. It's extremely messy. But basically inside here, I have a gyroscope, accelerometer, magnetometer for the motion detection. So it's like an Apple Watch, but it has a couple of extra sensors to give it that precise thing we need. Then we have a pulse sensor just to detect my pulse at all times. Then we have an Arduino to actually communicate with everything, a Bluetooth LE chip to talk to the phone, and a portable battery and charger to, um, to power everything. Then for software, I used um, Swift and Xcode to build the app and Arduino C++ to build the device. And Google Firebase controls all the backend friend stuff and all the networking and stuff like that. So for further improvement, obviously, this could have a better design because right now it's kind of a cardboard <laughs> box. We could put it in a PCB board, which would be a lot neater. We could improve the al algorithms because right now, sometimes, like I guess 5% of the time, they maybe tend to fail. So we could make that a bit better and a better ergonomic structure would be great too. So that's all I had. At the end of the day, I'm pretty sure, uh, I hope FitBuddy will- And you will, did this um, all you. by yourself or did you have other team members uh, with you? It was just me, yeah. Wow, that's, nice. uh, <laughs> yeah, props to that. Um, and on top of that, like in order to test this, you had to do that many push-ups. Like think about all the times that you probably didn't have- I, did so, I, did so, you have no idea how many, how many times I did push-ups this weekend. And, so and was the, you, you gave a pretty good demo. Like we saw the three. Is it pretty? Is it pretty accurate at grabbing those? Like if you, um, if you move around, it's not gonna, it's not gonna pick it up at all. So the way it works, basically, when you do a push up, there's a bunch of sensors in here, and it creates like a 3D graph of your movement and how it looks. So basically, you have to exactly mimic that movement. It might be a bit longer or shorter, but you have to mimic that movement in order to get the rep to count. So basically, Did you fill, fill with in, like, taking, um, like doing squats or any other exercises. So basically for this demo, I built both um, push-ups and sit-ups because obviously it takes time to develop for one, right? But um, for further use, obviously, like I'd um, develop a lot more exercises because that would obviously be helpful for different people. Yeah, what, what I would recommend is like, if possible, if you could use and leverage the existing Apple Watch APIs for this kind of stuff rather than that's having- definitely, That's definitely something I thought about because obviously with the Apple Watch, we'd get a lot more user base, right? Yeah. But um, the thing about the Apple Watch is Obviously, I don't currently own one right now. And the second thing is- um, That is a limitation. Uh, yeah, the, the sensors inside, of course, there is an accelerometer so that like it knows when you're looking at it. But there's two other sensors in here, a magnetometer and a gyroscope that give it that bit of extra precision. But I'm sure it would work with an Apple Watch too. I just haven't tested it. Right. Is there any is there any interest in using like computer vision to do this? Because it was interesting just like watching you do the push-ups and then like seeing that through. Through the camera, I think, like, imagine like my what if my what if I want to like compete with somebody today, but they don't have a Fit Buddy yet, and so my motivation think, is in yeah. that. But what about later? I think that would definitely that's definitely something that like it, it has a lot of a potential. But I think it'd be like a separate application in that it'd be more computer vision focused versus like a hardware device. So that'd be more of just a software project. Last yeah. last tip. I did just check and it looks like both the Apple Watch and the iPhone have um, accelerometers and gyroscopes and oh, magnetometers. They have gyroscopes too? Oh, they one do. thing that you can consider doing is actually ask the person to put their phone on their back 
And then like, you might be able to get this to work just with the phone, possible. Like imagine yeah. if you're doing push-ups and you just have your phone on your back. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Might, actually, might actually be able to do yeah. it. I, I think uh, I think Tiffany's on to something. I think if you could if you could go to computer vision, it might not be a yeah, bad yeah, yeah. because if you think of Tonal and you think of some of the other companies that are that are doing this, but in a much higher end. Yeah, but dude, Tonal costs mm -hmm. like two thousand yeah. dollars. I know yeah, that's what I mean. You could yeah, bring that completely down, but like, <laughs> imagine if you could do it with your yeah. phone, and that would be super. Because Cassard has a computer vision company. That's why he's pitching you on computer vision. <laughs> Hey, that's, it's the, the, you know, I'm, I'm not by, is, what's the old saying? When you hammer, everything's a nail. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I but it just makes it sense. It's, it's, it's less cumbersome and it's more uh, accessible mm. to people, you know? Yeah, I did it with the hardware device just out of curiosity, but I'm sure it would work like really well with the other platforms too. Yeah, no, it's super yeah. legit. All right, thank you, Arad. Right, thank and you next guys. up we have uh, Haran presenting Fridge Space. Hi everyone. Going to show my screen here. Hi, so we're Fridge Space. Fridge Space is a system which incentivizes food donation by lowering the barrier of entry. We make it possible to donate from the comfort of one's own home. So the problem we're tackling is the 2.2 million tons of edible food waste each year, which is costing Canadians around $17 billion every year. And most of the food waste we incur is avoidable. So it's often difficult for people to donate food because the existing system is often seen as inconvenient, lacks safety, and lacks education for the general public, such as um, what food items are in demand and what to avoid and donation etiquette, et cetera. So how may we encourage people to donate food regularly by making it possible to do so from the comfort of their own home? Our solution is fridge space. So I'm going to hand it off to Heron to do a live demo. Okay, perfect. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to do a live demo through a stream here. Uh, our app is Fridge Space, and upon opening the app, we have a slideshow of the tutorial of the app, kind of to get a, the user to understand what the app is about before uh, signing up. So we can log in or sign up here, and we're going to use the Facebook API to sign up. Let's go through. Here's my Facebook. And upon signing up, we'll be presented with this homepage where we have the top see more information and resources about donation etiquettes, uh, local nonprofits, and just education in general. Down here, we have a See My Surplus, mm -hmm. which will show uh, items that we currently have that we can donate. Uh, we can also request package, which once we build a full system that allows the uh, community to uh, uh, send shipments, we can use this to uh, request boxes to put our leftovers in. And we can also schedule pickups for trucks to come by or various donation spots to drop our things off. So here on our map, we can see various food banks and shelters. We're going to go to one randomly. So downtown Eastside Women's Center, you can see here that uh, they need non-perishables, fresh fruit and vegetables. And I can also see that there's 24 households that have donated here today, bringing in a gamification aspect. So we're going to go ahead and donate. Uh, with the camera, we can just scan the item. See, we have an orange here. And it will automatically identify that it is an orange, making it simple for the user. And we're going to go ahead and add that to cart. And we're going to add another banana. banana. And oh, it said it was a slug. That's because the banana is probably pretty black. But if there's a <laughs> yellow one, we can identify it being a banana. Um, but obviously, uh, we can also add that to cart. And once we go to cart, we'll have our items identified and it'll be easy for the user to pack it up and send it off. And essentially, you'll also be able to see in the uh, menu here how many people you've donated and how many people you've helped, making it more incentive, make giving you more incentive to do donations. Um, and yeah, this is essentially our app. 
Well, that's true. Do, guys, do, you, do you want to talk about some of the uh, tech behind it, especially the computer vision stuff? Yeah, sure. So we decided to uh, make a process as simple as possible. We don't want users having to type all their thing because it's too much work. So we used Apple's uh, ResNet 50 on the core ML model. Um, had we had more time, we would have liked to make our own model through some ensemble method and deploy it through a TensorFlow Lite onto the mobile. But uh, due to lack of time, we had to just use something Apple provided and also a model that wouldn't crush our computers with the upload um, size and stuff. Um, so that's what we chose. And essentially it works to some degree for most of the common fruits and vegetables and uh, common household food items. So there's a, uh, there's a YC company um, called Copia that, that looks to take uh, food waste from businesses. And uh, just uh, outside of the hackathon, you should reach out to the founder um, because I think she's had similar problems in terms of just categorizing and sending food. And they're doing from businesses to food banks, but you know, this, this solution can be applied to, uh, to them. And, 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 and on that note, I think it might actually be easier because those businesses are going to be doing it repeatedly on a, on a kind of a daily or, or weekly basis. So they're, they're going to know the quirks early on as the application isn't completely baked. And as, as you get, and, you know, you just have a very clear group of people you can get feedback from because they're, they're very much going to be in the flow. But it's uh, super interesting. Thank you. Yeah. So in terms of product design, um, we kind of thought about having um, so we really envision it uh, being a platform for both restaurant, bakery, um, people who will be making large uh, quantities of donation regularly. Um, but we also wanted to encourage just regular household uh, to donate, food, which we see is um, kind of lacking out there. Uh, that's why we came up with this solution. That's awesome. I, I feel like um, I'm here in Oakland, California, and I saw a billboard one time that talked about like the average family throws away almost like a ton of food a year. And so that would be amazing just to have this like, I mean, yes, the business side of it is great, but just everyday people. I think about how much food I just threw out moving out of my apartment, and I would love to have seen something like this. Yeah, for sure. So um, the four of us building this app, we're actually uh, all from Vancouver, and um, we came up with the idea because uh, in Vancouver, the homeless population actually, uh, they, uh, so downtown east side is only uh, within a 10 miles radius from the wealthiest neighborhood here. Um, so this kind of allowed us to think, uh, why isn't a system um, built in place already for food donations to be made regularly? Um, so yeah, we just thought it would be really cool to create this system. That's awesome. All right. Thank you Great so work. much, Jenny and Heron. Thank you for the demo. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, next up, we have Anson presenting Legist. Hello, hello. Nice to meet you, Tiffany, Kassar, and Eric. Um, so I'm Anson, and we're from Legist. This is Jackie. Um, and we're going to be presenting a short video for you today, about three minutes long. Um, but before we get into it, I want to do a quick shout out to the rest of our team members. So firstly, Rishi, the coolest and youngest dev on our team. Fun fact, he's only 15 years old. And to Christina, the best designer that we could ask for. So without further ado, um, I will sh present our video for you guys to see. All righty. Here we go. Through polarizing discussion and debates, we have become a population that is obsessed with politics, but knows close to nothing about actual policy. Despite considering myself pretty politically involved, I admit I have absolutely no idea where to get consistent, readable, and reliable information on the political issues I claim to care about. And I know I'm not alone in this. With hundreds of reports being released every single week, it's a lot to keep up with. Introducing Logist a portmanteau of the word legislature and the French word for legist. Our approach has two main parts. First, to summarize the important pieces, breaking down 4,000 words to around 150. Secondly, we deliver all this data in a meaningful and accessible way. We link up updates through our custom webhook engine, and we also provide real-time updates on new pieces of government literature and policies in our in-app feed. Now, let's get into a brief tour of the entire platform. You know, we can go ahead and create a new account. I'm going to go ahead and sign into an account that I already have. You know, we sign in. These are all the different policies that the algorithm thinks might be interesting for us, right? In my case, you know, I said that I was interested in Indigenous studies. I was interested in healthcare, 
right? And so it's automatically recommended those to me. And so you know, we've constructed an entire real-time um, GraphQL API surrounding this. Um, obviously the web front end is just a light wrapper over this, but this has real-time support. It has a serverless web hooks along with asynchronous control um, and granular control over every single one of these endpoints. There are a bunch of different features. You can check all of them out. Part of what makes Logist so powerful is the machine learning that powers it. For example, here is one seven page PDF document that no one really bothers to read the entirety of. Um, with Logist machine learning models, we can simplify it down to just a simple paragraph. Um, this is due to our Distilbert model, which does text sum summarization very well. In addition, we have two other language models that we use to perform analysis on it. The first of which is zero shot categorical classification, which we do using BART, and we do name entity recognition using Distilbert. And now for our text, <laughs> our web part was built in React with extensive use of SWR and Chakra UI. We deployed it to Vercel and Google Cloud. For our backend, we did all of our authentication in Firebase and we used TypeScript and GraphQL to power a serverless async web engine. We also used the Apollo editor to wrap CockroachDB in GraphQL. As for machine learning, to summarize the text, we used Distill Bart CNN. For named entity recognition, we used Bart Large. And for our zero show categorization prediction, we used Bart Large. For infrastructure, we dockerized Flask to serve our machine learning models on Google Cloud Run. And our data proc was done using Node running on Google Cloud as well. So why does any of this matter? As of right now, if the news doesn't make the headlines, it'll often go unnoticed. And this can't be the case because real political change needs to happen gradually. Ultimately, Logist allows for real-time updates on important policies in a digestible way, making the barrier to entry as low and simple as following a Twitter account. And all in all, our team had a grand old time this weekend. We laughed, cried, and fell asleep at our keyboards. We've grown a little too attached to the project to let it die after a hackathon, so we'll see where it goes from here. And together, together let's democratize democracy. Alrighty, so yeah, happy to take any questions you guys may have. The presentation itself could have been uh, part of the, <laughs> it was so well done. Um, uh, it, it, it's super interesting. Um, where, where do you, um, uh, where, where do you think, uh, how do you just initially just get users? Because I, I feel like um, if I if I saw this come across my screen, uh, how, how do you kind of uh, communicate to the end user that the summarization will be one that's, you know, high quality, that's not, it's not gibberish. Um, I, I feel like I've seen something like this before, but, but it, it could be wrong. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we actually had the same concerns going into this. We're like, how do we know that this is actually something that people would want to read? We don't want to be injecting garbage into people's feeds. So we actually took um, a, bas a batch test um, and then we ran it through kind of like a readability test. And then it was mostly from like a grade 10 to a grade 11 level so that it was something that was like very legible, easy to consume, um, especially in like small, like soundbite formats without having uh, without losing the nuance. Um, yeah, so in terms of like user acquisition and bringing people on board, I think that um, it's in, like first you would want to explore like the niche, um, like networks of individuals who are like extremely interested in politics. So like political science students, just people that generally want to get like um, uh, like brief updates for example like uh you could take an example of espresso by the economist they have brief updates given um brief updates given of important news um on a daily basis so i believe that this would be something in a similar category and the types of people that would read that type of content would most likely um, if they're interested in policy also pursue this um, as well if jackie has anything to add he can cool yeah a little bit more on the technical side uh, to make sure that our model is not gibberish uh, we looked at some of the factors of like how much we want to reduce text by it and we found that um, the model that we used uh, to still um, did around a 93.5 percent like text reduction so around 4,000 words to 150 words on average um, and it still maintained all of the important characteristics inside of the document, which was really nice to see. Is there a way as a user, as a consumer of the summaries to actually like offer feedback on the summaries? Oh, um, yeah, I wish Rishi, Rishi was here because he would have so much to say <laughs> about that question. Um, so we had this like brainchild at like 3 a.m. in the morning and we're like, what if users could also contribute? Because like the tenet of democracy is that you have a whole bunch of voices that are fragmented over a like a large area of people, like large demographics. So it would be a disservice for our platform not to be able to allow the same type of like user feedback as well. So um, what we ended up deciding to integrate is for um, users to be able to email in their own PDFs um, to receive different rollups of summarized material on like a consistent basis if they if they decide to subscribe. 
and anything okay, to add? It. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. So are there are there um, particular topics that you've started with? Because I think this would be something that's actually useful that you should continue mm -hmm. with. I mean, I say that about all the projects, but I think this one really is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, based off of just an, our initial scraping off the uh, Canadian government website, I think there was, we came up with a total of 14 uh, based off of some periodical meetings that happen a lot in government. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the highlights include, uh, I think, Indigenous policy, uh, healthcare, um, defense, um, any, any other numbers? Healthcare, a whole bunch. Yeah, we were initially going to do 13, but that's an unlucky number, so we, yeah. we just add one more. <laughs> but yeah, nice. great. So that's basically it from us. Uh, we're being told to kind of hurry off the stage now. <laughs> um, so yeah, great talking to you guys. And um, thank you so much for um, granting us the time to present our idea. You're welcome. Right. Thank you, Anson. Thank you very much. Wow, Jessica, weren't those projects incredible? Yeah, they were really, really awesome. And also huge thank you to you guys, um, our judges, uh, Cassar, Eric, Tiffany, for, for like giving all of these insightful comments about the projects. I feel like uh, my weekend was not as productive as all of these folks. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the last, uh, uh, you know, the few days, I've, uh, what, what did I do? What did I accomplish relative to this? <laughs> exactly. Very impressive. All right, thank you guys so much. <laughs> So we hope you enjoyed our mini showcase of just some of our 24 finalists we have this year. So next up, we'll be announcing our API prize winners. First off, for the best use of CockroachDB, uh, congratulations to the Flask team. Flock team, my bad. Congratulations to the Flock team. And next, the winners for the best use of the VoiceFlow app are Cast3D, or is Cast3D. Next, the winners for the best use of the Dropbase API is Price Easy. And next, the winner for the best use of the Facebook API prize is Sophia. For the best use, uh, the winners of the Ubisoft Nest Challenge API um, is Paint Pong. And next, the winner for the best use of the IBM API prize is Vac Alert. For the best use of the Vonage API prize, we have Priovax. And next, the winner for the Hack Azure prize is Fine Finneract. Finneract. And fi uh, next, for the winners of the best use of the Hootsuite API prize, is Omakase. And finally, we have the winners of the Cansofcom drone challenge, and they are. Uh, Sinclair Hudson and the winners for the Cans of Calm challenge is Cans Some Cam. Congratulations, huge congratulations to all of our API prize winners. Um, the sponsors will be reaching out via email after the event is over to work out your prize delivery. And now let's invite back Jacqueline from MLH on stage to present the MLH prize winners. Hey there. Um, Actually, I'm going to step in for Jacqueline. My name is Jamie. I think everyone did an amazing job this weekend. I hope you all had an amazing time. This is my second year back at Hack the North, and I had just as much fun as last year. So quickly to announce our winners, the first one is going to be the best use of Google Cloud, and the winners are going to be winning a Google backpack, and the winner is Fitmotive. Secondly, the best use of domain.com. Uh, is going to be win a wireless charger with a backpack, and the prize and uh, project winners is Can You Survive? And last but not least, the best use of DigiKey is going to be winning a Grove Beginner Kit with an Arduino. And we have two winners uh, during Hack the North this weekend. And first one is going to be Tabular. Second one is FitBuddy. So congratulations to everyone. Congratulations to all of our finalists for Hack the North 2020 Plus um, Plus. And one more final congratulations to all of you for putting the time and effort into building amazing things this weekend. Now, to end off the night, we'd like to welcome our co-directors, Emily and Patrick, for some closing remarks. Hello, everyone. Uh, just give us one second. We're just waiting on uh, one more thing. Sorry uh, for technical difficulties. Oh. We're not live yet, right? Um. 
All right. Hi, everyone. So uh, we're going to start to send off a few remarks uh, from Emily and I. Hack the, Hack the North 2020 Plus Plus was filled with lots of firsts. From our first virtual event to our first pre-hackathon event, Gear Up, to running with over 3,000 hackers, this year's event has truly been like no other. Thank you all for being part of this experience, and we hope you had an amazing time learning new skills, participating in activities, connecting with other hackers, and most importantly, building some amazing projects. While our event has evolved, the founding mission to make it easy for anyone to dream big that started Hack North back in 2014 has definitely not changed. Whether it's providing technical resources or a welcoming community, we hope that we've been able to help you dream big this past weekend. It's been an amazing weekend for us and hopefully an even more amazing weekend for you. We'd like to take some time to recognize some of the people who made this event possible. 41 incredibly de dedicated student volunteers have spent the last 10 months planning this event. The organizing team of 2020 Plus Plus devoted hundreds of hours into making the weekend you just experienced possible. To all of our amazing workshop leads, who delivered a total of 32 workshops over the course of Gear Up and this weekend, inspire and empower all of you to build your projects and learn new things. Gear Up wouldn't have been possible with all of the amazing content each one of them delivered. We'd also like to thank again all of our judges and speakers for coming to engage with hackers at Hack the North. It's truly an invaluable experience for students to receive feedback from and be inspired by incredible industry, uh, industry leaders. So thank you for taking the time to come out and be part of helping hackers dream big at Hack the North. Next, to all of our mentors and volunteers. Mentors, we're so grateful for all of the support that you provided to hackers over the weekend. And to the volunteers who helped make our judging process as smooth as possible, thank you. Next up are our sponsors. It takes a lot of financial support to make Hack the North happen. Everything you experienced this weekend would not have been possible without their support and belief in us to be able to deliver this experience to over 3,000 of you. Thank you to our gold sponsor, RBC. Our silver sponsors, Deloitte, Hootsuite, ACV Auctions, Can'tStuff.com, and Facebook. Our bronze sponsors, IBM, IMC Trading, Ubisoft, Firebase, Shopify, CSE, Citadel, OTPP, KPMG, Cash App, Cockroach Labs, General Dynamics Mission Systems, Microsoft, Procter & Gamble, Vonage, and Sunlife. And last but not least, our startup sponsors, Archetype, Dropbase, Voiceflow, Next Canada, and Contrary. Next up are our partners. We'd like to thank Major League Hacking for providing awesome swag you'll be receiving, continuous support, and guidance throughout the year. Thank you to the Founder Institute, as well as Pinnacle for providing unique post-event opportunities to our hackers. We're so proud to be supported by the University of Waterloo, the University of Waterloo Faculty of Mathematics, and the University of Waterloo Faculty of Engineering. Specifically, we'd like to thank Carrie Griffith, our full-time event planner from engineering. She's been involved with the team since the beginning back in 2014, and has been absolutely instrumental to the event every year. Hack the North is an initiative under Techion, a student-run nonprofit organization dedicated to empowering the next generation of tech leaders. Throughout the year, Techion also supports local student learning communities in product management, data science, design, and tech for social good. If you've ever been interested in contributing to Waterloo's tech community, reach out to them at hello at techion.org to get involved. But lastly, thank you for bringing yourselves, your time, and your talent to Hack the North 2020 Plus Plus to build almost 600 projects. Whether you're a first time hacker or a hackathon veteran, you should be very proud of yourselves. And we are so grateful that you could be here this weekend. With that, that's a wrap on Hack the North 2020 Plus Plus. Thank you all so much for attending. And we hope to see you again at the next Hack the North.